My name is Bond. Bond. James Bond. James Bond. British secret agent James Bond 007 is at a terrorist arms bazaar on the Russian border where he gets into a scuffle to save two nuclear torpedoes from being detonated. Elsewhere, a British naval ship is sunk by media mogul Elliot Carver, bringing the world to the brink of World War III. James Bond is brought in and sent to investigate. Bond lands in Hamburg, Germany, where he picks up his new car from Q Branch and then goes to a launch party held by Elliot Carver. Bond bumps into Elliot's wife, Paris Carver, who happens to be an old flame. Meanwhile, Carver is taken in by Wei Lin of the New China News Agency. Bond provokes Carver and gets a response. Carver does a background check on James Bond, and Bond gives a thorough check of Paris Carver. Bond does a little recon at Carver's newspaper tomorrow and finds a missing encoder. Bond bumps into Wei Lin before all hell breaks loose. Bond escapes trouble but gets a call from Elliot Carver, which sends Bond back to his hotel room, where he finds Paris Carver murdered. But Bond realizes he's not alone. Bond takes out Dr. Kaufman, and then escapes via his remote control BMW. Bond arrives at a U.S. air base in the South China Sea, and uses the encoder to locate the missing British warship. Bond does a high-altitude, low-opening jump into the South China Sea, locating the missing vessel, and bumps into a familiar face. Bond and Wei Lin are captured and brought to the Carver headquarters in Saigon, but Bond and Wei Lin escape via a one-armed motorcycle chase. Wei Lin gives Bond the slip, but they are soon reunited. Together they join forces, and the two search for Carver's stealth boat. Bond and Wei Lin board Carver's boat, and after a whole lot of shooting, Bond takes out Carver, escapes Carver's right-hand man, and rescues Wei Lin. The British Navy makes short work of Carver's boat, and Bond and Wei Lin go off the radar. Written by Bruce Firestein and directed by Roger Spottiswood, 1997's Tomorrow Never Dies. Yeah. <laughs> one of Scott's favorites. I've been hey, waiting for this hey. one. <laughs> um, yeah, no, um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm, I, this, I'm not a fan of this film. Um <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of wondering. I was sort of wondering if possibly you might soften up a little bit having you seen know, it. Go you ahead. know what? I, I, I went I went downstairs and watched this, you know, and I had um, I had my butt kickers going in and I had the surround sound and I'm watching the opening scene. I'm like, you know what? This isn't bad. I was a little tough on this. Uh, and then and then the picture started to keep going and going and I was like, oh, yeah. Now <laughs> I remember. Uh, um. And I figured out this, you know, I think we've talked about this before in like older podcasts. We had talked about this before. Hmm. And I think I, I kind of focused on the execution of the film, the way it was edited, uh, the way, the, you know, the camera placement, things like that, which I'm still not a fan of. But I was kind of saying, well, that's primarily the reason, you know. Hmm. But looking at it this time, I came up with it. I was like, there's something else here. There's something else that's bothering me about this movie. And I came to realize it's um, after the when the opening credits is okay, it's fine. It's not my mm -hmm. cup of tea the way the action is directed, but it's fine, right? But then they do after the main title sequence, which the Show Crow song, which I think they they chose the wrong. So I, I like I like Show Crow, but um, I think the Katie Lang song that ends uh -huh. the film, Surrender, is much better. I think it's just. I think it's the best song of the Brazen era, personally. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe neck and neck with Goldeneye is pretty good too. But anyway, I'm watching the uh, 
that opening scene is the sinking of that shit. The, 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 the Devonshire? Uh-huh. Um, right, oh, is it Devonshire or Devonshire? Depends where you live, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll make everybody happy. So yeah. I'm watching this whole thing, and they're kind of, I don't know, for some reason I find that scene really boring, but it goes through this whole thing. It pretty much gives away the, everything. You know, because it it shows you it shows you how he gets in, and you know how he's causing you know, how uh, Ellie Carver's disrupting everything here. Um, mm. It shows you that big drill that goes through the submarine, and it pretty much shows you uh, what Ellie, you know, the, the the actual end result, which is you know Ellie Carver gets to write his headline there, you know, by causing uh -huh. this mayhem. And I'm thinking, all right, let's let's take one moment here. Let's go to um, let, let's look at Goldfinger. That's you know a movie that pretty much everybody knows the story of. What if in, in Goldfinger you had the opening uh, teaser like you do now? You mm -hmm. had your main credits, and then the opening scene was Goldfinger, you know, doing like a mini heist. Okay, and he's going in there, and he goes in there, and he activates a little bomb, and he you know he eradicates the gold, and you know he's and then he says you know delicious, um, you know I can't wait to do this on a bigger scale at Fort Knox. Uh -huh. there, there's no sense of mystery after that, because I I know everything. I mean, you know I know L.A. Carver, Jonathan Price is the bad guy, and I know uh -huh. uh, Maury Goldfinger, Griff Robe is the bad guy, but at least in Goldfinger the, the plot sort of blossomed out a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. you knew he was a bad guy, but you didn't quite know what he was up to. You know, yeah. the first time you're watching it, and here that's it's it's like no, it's like here you go. This is everything in the first you mm -hmm. know 10, 15 minutes, and uh, there's nothing there's nothing left. It's just all action scenes. There's, mm -hmm. there's not there's no surprises. I don't know. Um, I. I <laughs> I hear what you're saying, and <laughs> I, but I, I, I'll take a little issue with that because sure, I, I sure kind of feel ahead. like, um, well, first of all, this is hardly the first Bond film where you sort of know who the bad guy is a little early on, and um, I guess what I, I'm saying is, you know, yeah, you do, but you don't know, you don't get the full details like in, right after the main credits. Yeah, like you no, no, yeah, it. yes, I get you. Um, no, your point is taken. Honestly, That's terrible um, storytelling. I'm sorry. In fact, <laughs> if in fact, I actually sort of said to myself as I was watching this, I kind of felt like I kind of forgot that the opening taking place on the on the um, the battleship as it does kind of gave me flashbacks of like the spy who loved me. Um, See, the spy who loved me does it good because it's a sense of mystery. Right, you right. You don't know what's happening. You know, you know, you know, and, and you know, you have the guy, and he goes, "Oh my god!" And and then yeah. you know, and then they do a hard cut to the um, the, the the you know the admiralty. But yeah, but and that that that's great because now now you got me on the hook. Now you got mystery here going. Yeah. With, See, but the that. thing is, in 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 the spy who loved me, they'll do it again later. Here, they really don't. No. So this is sort of your only opportunity to sort of see the the thing happening and sort of getting what's happening. And honestly, it's boring it's, as hell. I'm sorry, I don't know why it just bores really? me. Really? I didn't yeah. think so. I, I think it's kind of boring. And see, it, 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 what is that? That that Dave Arnold queue is like eight minutes long. It's great music. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Eight, it's that's like a reel. Yeah, it, it, it takes minutes. a while. Oh my goodness. Yeah, but again, it, like it, the threat here is not so much that he's going to do that same thing again. Really, I feel like it, it like. If, if the only thing that they were they were worried about is that he's going to sink another ship, then I could see your point that you've already blown it. I've already seen it in action. So what's the big threat? And what's the mystery? But this is really just the 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 linchpin to start the whole thing. So it's not like you're not really ruining a bigger surprise later. Yeah, because there are no surprises. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, folks. Good night. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't. I don't. That that was. Yeah. I'm watching this, and I'm like, there's nothing left. There's nothing left. I mean, you and you, you're you're reliant on the action scenes, and if you don't like the action scenes, guess what? You're in trouble. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that's true. I mean, it is. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of suspense in that respect. I, I, I will, I grant you that. I mean, we, we've sort of been building up to this for a while where <laughs> suspense this is, is not exactly... Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, I get it. Um, <laughs> suspense is not, not the film's strong suit at this point. It, it, it is very much, literally, like you said, it's, it's really relying on the action. I feel like as I was watching it this time around, though, I was sort of feeling a little bit better about it. Two things were going through my head. First of all, there were a lot more Bond moments in here that I kind of gave it credit for, I think. Like, good ones, not just kind of token dropped in. Mm, um, I don't know about that, but all right, but go ahead. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the big one that I know you'll you'll love. Okay. Um, the shot of Bond goes in, 
um, for the big meeting. He drops the newspaper down. And then afterwards, they leave, and they're in the car, and Emma's giving him his assignment. Now this is I hate, I, the, I hate the way that's directed because it's so I, distracting. I, I see. I felt like, and it, it's probably simply a matter of now. I'm very used to that sort of. I, I feel like there's so many movies now, like you said, the Michael Bay's and and all this, uh, the jump, the shaky cam stuff, like the wildly cut films are so mainstream now that I that honestly, honestly, I sort of felt like this really didn't bother me at all in comparison. I, you know, it's not only the editing here. I just don't. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I, this is. Let's chalk it up to taste. I hate the camera placement. Almost every shot in this movie, I want to take the camera and just move it over a few. <laughs> I don't know. I do. I do not like it. And, and that whole thing, given that exposition in the car, because it, yeah. and it's and they, they 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 take cuts that were like I guess supposed to be establishing shots, and then go out of the car and then do a voiceover mm. and then come back into the car. It's yeah. very distracting, and I, I can't even pay attention really to what they're saying because I'm. I, I didn't find oh, they got all that crap going yeah. on. Yeah. Uh. I uh, yeah again. I mean, I, I think they're. I mean, they're trying to to give you a sense of urgency. And there was one, there was one odd shot I noticed, like when you see Money Penny, like all of a sudden, like the 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 glass comes down, and there she is. And she hands Bond something, and he, he kind of does a double take, like he didn't even know she was there. Then they cut to outside the car to sort to sort of establish where she's sitting, that she's in the passenger seat of the front seat. And I kind of was like, I'm like, yeah, but you didn't need that. And then, and then, like, <laughs> I, I agree with you that the camera was just sort of off. So by the time you realized where she was and where she was sitting, it was done. So I was like, <laughs> right. well, why did I, why did I need to know where she's sitting? No, I, yeah, but yeah, again, I don't know. I just kind of. I it didn't that really didn't bug me as much this time. But again, I, I could just be, you know, I, I've kind of been beaten down by that editing style so well, bad in other films that this one just felt like nothing. Let me back up for a second and say, OK, between, you know, I think in the 80s, with, let's call it mid 80s, late 80s, that the action, the pace of films in general started to change, mm. um, especially the action film. I think you probably could trace the roots maybe to Tony Scott. Um, but he handles it really well. I mean, there's some great Tony Scott films. But I think you could even say, I don't, it's hard to say one movie, you know, started it. But if I had to pick one, I'd say maybe Top Gun. Because I think a lot of those directors came from music videos, like Michael Bay. And, yeah. uh, you know, they had to make a splash in a two or three minute time span, you know. And they're good at that. They were excellent at that, as in fact. But then you get these guys over to feature length films and it's a different a different beast. Mm. But I think I, I think some some films like that are successful, others aren't. Um, and I think, but it became the norm for the action film. You know, it was like two times the pace. You know, they double timed it almost yeah. everything. And um, you know, I think the Bond producers looked at it and said, you know what, we got to get with the times. We can't we can't just you know do our old old shtick now. We have to move. You know, yeah. keep this thing going. And this is like pre born movies and stuff. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, the pace of the f film started to go. So I kind of get it. I do. Mm. Um, I just don't think it's handled well. Because I, I, I love this Tony Scott films I love. I love like True Romance, yeah. Crimson Tide. Um, th there's some great Tony Scott films. Um, yeah. But yeah, this. Yeah, no, I, listen, I'm, I'm with you there. And I, you know, I, I kind of feel like it's funny. You know how throughout this whole series I've kind of remarked that every so often you feel the jump forward in time yeah and then of course with the last one with GoldenEye it was like well that's a given I mean it, there were, it was a five year hiatus right. so sure enough it's going to feel a lot a lot more modern etc I feel like even just between GoldenEye and now there's a little bit of a jump because GoldenEye seemed to want to, to, to set that in a sort of a timelessness you know a, a world that is kind of timeless you know here they very much jump forward in terms of technology. You know, we have to have cell phones and self-starting cars and, and all that sort of stuff. And even like like when when they, they, they that scene at the party in Hamburg, there's like these laser lights all over the place. So they try to make this one very modern. And yeah, it's like 15, 15 minutes ahead in the future or something like that. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, so yeah, I and I kind of feel like the the cutting style, the editing style probably followed suit where they they said well we have to sort of oh. get that a little more up to speed etc 
You know, it's it's funny. Um, I was really excited about this movie, you know, before it came out because uh, Roger uh, Spotswood he was um, he did editing with uh, Sam Peckinpah. So I was like, wow, you know, that guy that was a great uh, guru or what have you to have as your uh, edit, you know the guy to teach you editing. You know, because mm. if you've seen the Sam Peckinpah mil- movie, you know, editing is like a huge thing for that for yeah. his for his movies. Um, so I was kind of excited about that. Um, I had gotten in, in the '90s because um, I, I, because I couldn't, I didn't really like that style of the action film. So I kind of turned into the Hong Kong films during the '90s. Mm. So I was really excited that Michelle Yeoh was going to be in the film. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I had seen like films like uh, she did a film call with Cynthia Rothrock called Yes, Madame, and there's some great action choreography in that. Stories, eh, but the a- action is terrific. There's one scene I remember in particular where they're um, they're in this, um, it's like in this room, uh, or it's in this, it's kind of like a lobby, but it's like all surrounded by glass, and they have this big martial arts fight. It's yeah. really a terrific scene, and, and she did a couple other things too, uh, most notably. Uh, uh, she she had a little late eighties and then had a hiatus and then came back in the nineties with Jackie Chan. She did uh, Police Story Three Super Cop, um, which she did like amazing stunts in that. Like she was um, she there's one uh, stunt where she's on a motorcycle and she jumps onto a moving train. I mean, mm. <laughs> it's just amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, she's and she's going toe to toe with Jackie Chan, which is amazing. You know, amazing in itself. And here they have her like I don't know. I just I think she's underused here. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think she does have a screen presence, though. But, uh, yeah, yeah the, the the character ultimately of Wei Lin left me flat. It, it does feel that like they just gave her a couple token action yeah. scenes. It, yeah. It, yeah, they don't really... There's nothing extraordinary with her in this. Yeah. It's, it's a shame. I mean, there's really only... She goes to her home base, and there's some baddies there it's waiting like for her. scuffle, yeah. Yeah, and, they, and, and it's kind of odd, because I remember thinking, like, like, Elliot Carver all of a sudden has these, like, you know, kung fu fighters waiting at her place just perfectly <laughs> so she can have a kung fu fight. And like I don't know. By, that, by that time in the movie, I could give two craps because I'm so out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to mark you down as undecided. <laughs> hey, do you know? Hey, did you see Elliot Carver show up on the uh, Golden Globes uh, a few weeks ago? <laughs> oh, I, well, I didn't watch it, but I heard it. Oh, could you, yeah. Well, here's the clip right here. <laughs> <laughs> no i love jonathan price he's a great actor and you know it's all in good fun yeah um i think he's terrific um uh i've seen him and you know he can do that you know he, he can do a role like this but he's also i've seen him there's a movie called glengarry glenn ross written by david mamet which mm-hmm. played in a movie but he plays in the movie he plays a guy who's sort of in over his head and uh totally believable yeah, but then he can, you know, he can turn around and uh, do a role like this, where he's in total mm. control. Yeah, uh, wow, great actor, terrific. See, I, you know, it's funny, and as long as we're talking about him, we might as well get into the whole plot. I, I, I kind of felt like he was just kind of okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, and, and you know, I should really say that the funny, one of the funny things about this film to me is that it almost felt like there was a conversation between the the filmmakers you know as they're developing the story and they're going who would be like a real life bond villain today and i think the best they could come up with it was sort of like this rupert murdoch you know style you know media mogul who's got more money than god and can manipulate things i i remember kind of feeling like but that kind of doesn't feel like a bond villain should be a little larger than life and and this didn't like feel that way to me. I feel like he does fine with the role. Like he's kind of he's like you said he's, he's like a mixture of like Rupert Murdoch and and um with like a, a taste of Hugh Hefner. You know, which is delicious. Right. That's that's, like a, <laughs> that's that's a Hugh Hefner thing to say. You know. Yeah, well, um, and uh, it's hard to def- you know they have uh, Terry Hatcher's in this movie uh, looking very lovely. Um, uh, as Paris, and you kind of wonder why would she hook up with this guy in the first place? Because there's no sign here of like a soft side to him or uh, something that you know. Unless you're like you're into money, why would you even give this guy ten seconds? You know. There, there's a very cynical side of me going, Scott. Really? Now, I ain't saying she a gold digger, but she ain't messing with no broke. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, the guy's the guy's loaded, you know. I mean, if she, <laughs> it's really, really. You, you, you never saw a really rich guy who <laughs> had a girl that was way out of his league. <laughs> Is Paris that shallow? I'm a little disappointed. Well, th- well, there you go. I mean, it does show <laughs> you know a little flaw in her character, and, and it yeah. does kind of answer the question: Why would Bond be with a girl who's who is that shallow? 
Um, I mean, there's, I mean, there's, there's a line in here when he says, you know, well, why did you marry him? And she just goes, he told me he loved me. That's it, <laughs> you know. Like, and he's rich. <laughs> and also, um, it comes to my head, uh, Ricky Jay's in this uh, as Gupta, and. I mean, he yeah. is such a great actor. I don't know if you've ever seen him in like some of the David Mamet stuff, like uh, House of Games and Heist. Um, he did some uh, Paul Thomas Anderson films like Magnolia, and I think he's in Boogie mm. Nights. Terrific actor. He gets nothing to do in this. Nothing. Yeah. It's really disappointing because he's such yeah. a terrific actor. And uh, um, God bless him. He's, he passed away last year, uh, late last yeah. year. But uh, I, he was a favorite of mine. I, I thought I was you know, every time I saw him, you know, as a supporting cast, I, you know, I'd sit up in my seat. Oh, OK, let's see what's going yeah, on. Yeah. You know, one of those type of actors. Yeah. And it's kind of a shame. It's completely wasted in this film. Yeah. It did. Like, I know there's a deleted scene where it shows him like he was able to like flip cards and stuff. Yeah. Uh, which I think was a real thing he could do. Yeah. yeah. He could do that for real. I mean, he could throw like a card at like 90 miles an hour or some crazy thing. It's uh -huh. <laughs> take nuts. But yeah. Um, yeah, he, they cut that out. And... Yeah, no, and, and you're right. You know, I, I find myself a lot of times in the Bond movies talking about people who seem miscast. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's it, it really isn't about them being miscast. It's just that they're not used. And if you weren't going to use them to their full capacity, why are you bothering? And this is one of those situations where if you're not going to use him the way he's meant to be used, then what do you, what do you, why would you bring him in? And we also briefly touched on Terry Hatcher, who I will say is totally miscast do you think so i think she does okay here i mean I, I, there's so it's such a minuscule role at the end of the day yeah um there's not much going on in it um, i, I kind of she, uh, she does fine she does a fine job uh, getting through it i think she, i mean she's yeah, i said this last week when we were talking about Zenya, and i said it irks me when they get american actresses last week i was specifically talking about american actresses playing foreign roles okay um here i think it's just american actresses i just don't like I, like there's something something so not exotic about terry hatcher um really? she i mean she's she's cute she's fine I, I mean like something like lois and clark she's fine um the the housewives tv show she was on back then it's i'm sure she's great at that stuff <laughs> I, I find her here just to be so kind of flat and boring. Um, and, and by the way, this was around the time when I was really, you know, hoping. I'm, sorry, no, so, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm waiting for something good to be said here. I, um, I, I, I was really pushing for Monica Bellucci around this time because Monica Bellucci was like in her prime. Wow. And I thought it been amazing. I got to admit. You, you want? I said. I said. You want to talk about somebody who is Bond's lost love, the one that would actually get under Bond's skin that he still would hold. Monica Bellucci would be the one for that role. I think that's hard to argue with. You know, I mean. So I. I just. And by the way, I've always heard that it's kind of un. She's sort of like um, unofficially. I, I. I've heard that they were going to cast her to play Sylvia Trench, that that's technically who she's playing. But they kind of decided not to not to do that and just change her name. But uh, from what I heard, she's kind of supposed to be like the Sylvia Trench character. Oh, really? Like she's the she's like she's like the only reoccurring, you know, Bond girl from back then. Okay. So I could kind of see that. But yeah, have, I mean, it would have been something like maybe if uh, she was in Goldeneye, like if she was the girl um, in the Aston Martin at the beginning of that, or something. Give us something. You know that would have been kind of cool, yeah. and then have her have her, you know, pass away in this. That might have had a at least a little more gravitas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think they at least tried very hard. And again, I kind of feel like this is probably Brosnan aching to do kind of a more dramatic kind of bring some actual drama into a Bond film. So the scenes of him and Paris together, I think are okay. Um, when they first meet again, she slaps him. It's fine. And then you know when she comes, I mean the. The scene with Bond sitting in the hotel room by himself, with the with the with the I mean he's got he's pouring shots of vodka, and he's got the gun and he puts the silencer on the gun and puts it down next to him. Now that's a cool shot. I mean that's good. I, I kind of find that to be very Bondish. You're not you're not. I'm not getting anything from you, Scott. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> no, yeah, that's not bad, but it's rude, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. <laughs> because. Um, they they do that shot and then they go they go to the scene with L.A. Carver and Paris, and then they come, yes. they, come back, they come back and it's like he's just been sitting there for uh, twenty minutes. 
in the same position. I don't know. Yeah. Well, wait, <laughs> but well, I don't that... know what happened. They they originally were just going to do the scene that way, and then she was going to walk in. You know, that's the scenery happened. But in yeah. post production, they decided to, to to start with him, go to them, and then come yeah. back to him. But that is really a really, awkward. it's very awkward. Yeah, and I, I've always looked at that little sequence there. And and I can't figure out what they were trying to do, and they couldn't seem to get it right. And you're right, the timing is very weird. She's here, then she's there, then whatever. Mm -hmm. It's it seems like, it's like it feels like she was talking to Elliot Carver, and then he goes to talk to Gupta, in the matter of a couple of minutes, and then somehow right, like you said, then she pops up in Bond's room. Right, and it doesn't feel right. It feels like something something got messed up there, and I'm not sure what it was. <laughs> so was he sitting there for an hour? I don't know. <laughs> this is this is, oh I'm sorry man but I can't stand the way they dress Q in this. <laughs> you know, it, it, they put him yeah. in that loud red j Avis jacket. Yeah. Oh, what a poor Desmond Llewellyn man. I, uh, <laughs> well, so, uh, you know that yeah. that's a problem with this movie. I think my personal opinion uh, of this film, they had certain choices to make, and everyone they make is like wrong for me the only thing that's outstanding in this film is that david arnold score it's like yeah like the thing they got wrong last time they they, they got it right here but then they came yeah. into this movie and they got everything else wrong <laughs> you, you know what see it's kind of funny i feel like everything you're saying reminds me of the first few times i saw this movie like back in the 90s and right. this, this is exactly what was going through my head um i totally agree with you that it did. It absolutely feels that way. Like they, they, they sat down and said, "Okay, well, what was wrong with Goldeneye? What did everybody not like?" And they fixed that. They got David Arnold in here, who does a awesome score. Yeah, yeah. it might be. It might be his best for like an individual listen on its own. Yeah, it might be his best score. Um, I, I wouldn't. Right. Yeah, I mean, I he's got so much good stuff. It would be hard for me to pick one yeah. like that. But yeah, it's I, awfully good too. Yeah, yeah. But even I, I kind of feel like this is sort of his. I love the Casino Royale score, but for different reasons. Mm -hmm. This one and The World Is Not Enough to me is so good because he's really relishing in the Bond theme. Yeah. Which even John Barry, again, like Barry would use it here and there, but it was pretty sparingly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Barry would usually use, he would he would do his action cues, you know, for each film and sort of go with that. Right. Arnold just felt like the Bond tune that's the action score that's the yeah. that's the, that's what that's what i want to play and he just plays that like it's the soundtrack i mean you know he uses that as as his score and i love it i feel like he's he does some of the most quintessential bond scoring you know ever agreed great stuff you know, yeah. you know i gotta say man you know barry's the man you know it's like you know there's no surpassing barry of course you know? yes yeah, yeah. but, but yeah but Dave Arnold's right there. Yeah. He's, he's a what a great composer. Well, you know what I do? I kind of like the the backseat driver stuff. You know, the remote control car and mm -hmm. that, that sequence. Not crazy about the camera setups on it, but uh, it's a good scene. And uh, Dave, I think the Dave Arnold score pushes me over on it. He has such fun with yeah. it that yes. uh, it's infectious. It's hard. It's almost mm -hmm. hard to resist yeah. having fun with that scene. Yes, I would totally agree with that. Yes, the score the, the score definitely does elevate it. I I think. As it, the action, well, the I think all of the action scenes in this movie, that's probably the best one. Yeah. Uh, the maybe. backseat driver. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think it is. Uh, the score is great. And the motorcycle chase is pretty good. Although I, I kind of feel like there's, there's certain times when I'm kind of just confused on why things are happening. Um, like yeah, that's the thing. I, I just wish I could. I, I mean, you could look at this movie and you tell, "Wow, man, they spent a fortune on this thing." You could tell yeah. just by looking at it. But yeah. yeah, it's hard. It's hard to enjoy anything. There's there's no relish. You know, mm. it's it's <sighs> everything is. This is the problem I have with movies like this with this kind of pace. And I and I get what you're saying. You know, movies have there's movies that come out since that are way faster and blah blah. blah. But the problem I have with it is that it's hard to enjoy almost any of it because you, you, everything's happening so quickly and mm. everything's about the pace. So you lose everything else. You know, you lose like the little subtleties and you lose mm. you lose subtext. You lose so much stuff. Yeah. 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 Listen, I'm, I, I'm not definitely not going to disagree as far as pace goes. I mean, that's for damn sure. Um, I, I guess my thought is, but if but if you can slow it down and I, I, I do feel that. On subsequent views, it gets better because once you sort of, I think the first couple times you see it, it's too bombastic, it's too quick. I, I totally agree with you. But then, like this, after you've seen it a couple times, 
then I kind of feel like the pace is not bothering me as much. So I sort of wonder if, like, maybe some of the method to the madness is that on repeat viewings, you're getting kind of a lot for your buck, and you're not really focused as much about the pace. It's not, not, no, huh? No. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> No, um, I was like, like a contemporary action film. Um, I'm thinking off my time. Okay, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Now, that's uh-huh. a good example of an action movie that has a fine pace. It's a great mm. pace, but it has these terrific action scenes where mm. um, it, the camera placement is terrific and it's edited just sublime. It's sublime and it's just, and it's just wonderful. So, yeah, you can, it can be done. It just, mm. I, I, I just don't like this movie and i just don't i don't like the choices made yeah. and even like in the, the the henchman stomper it's such a boring uh, oh, this Aryan guy which is n- given nothing he's just a yeah. big zero i mean it's just <laughs> it's it's like um you know he's kind of like a red grant soda and he's like it's uh, it, like that dude from you only live twice maybe because he has less screen time is maybe mm-hmm. a little less interesting but uh-huh. um yeah it just doesn't he doesn't do anything for me either uh, yeah this whole thing is <laughs> yeah um well all right w- w- give me something that you like give me give me something good <laughs> okay <laughs> Um, I said backseat driver, right? <laughs> that was good. All right. Um, how about um, pass? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, when, when I go to a James Bond movie, when James Bond movie comes out theatrically, mm. almost no matter what. I'll go see it two or three times, you know, because I'm a Bond fan. That's what Bond fans do. You know, you go, you go see it, and then you know, you get that first, you know, okay, now I got the story. Now I just want to go there and just, you know, study the film in, in, yeah, in a way. Yeah. This to me was one and done. I saw it once in the theater. I'm like, no, I'm done. <laughs> done. And I knew it's one of those movies where it's like one of those things where it loses you, yeah. and that's it. You're, you're done. Yeah. Um, and I was trying to go in this with a fresh thing. You know, when I, when I went to go watch this time, I said, okay, you know, just clear your head and, you know, get all those preconceived notions out of the way and just go and enjoy the film. And I, th- mm. there's too many, there's too many things that are a problem. I, I think, I think the script, I think the script is pretty bad. Um, I think the characters are ill-defined. Um, this is actually, in a way, this probably might be the most punless of the films, maybe. Um, only because they're in such a hurry to, to get mm-hmm. on to the next thing. Oh, you know what I do? I, I, and I, I know you. I don't think you're a huge fan of it, but I thought was. I think it's flawed but interesting. Is the Doctor Kaufman stuff? I think there's something really uh, in there. Um, but uh, I know that that's kind of played for laughs. Maybe that's the problem with it. It's like played for yeah. laughs. But I think that's yeah. interesting because it's different um, to see an assassin like that. So yeah. that at least interested me a little bit. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I like that. A lot of people like it. I don't dislike it, but that's another time when I'm really wishing they cast it a little bit differently, and got somebody who kind of looked like like a little more serious, a little harsh, <laughs> as opposed to. I mean, honestly, is he is he that much different than the mad scientist from? From a view to a kill. Oh God, no! He's much more <laughs> bad. Oh, that's harm. No, shame on you. I am Doctor Kaufman. Yeah. My name is Doctor Kaufman. <laughs> I could shoot you from Stutzgard. <laughs> and so I mean, and that's. I mean, that's a great line. Honestly, I, I, I really wish they cast somebody a little bit differently. I, I, I'm, he, he's a character actor I've seen a lot of times before, so you yeah. know he's doing a fake accent. <laughs> hey. if, if they got somebody in there who like looked it. like they were, yeah, I, if I they got somebody in there who looked like they meant yeah. business, and then they used those funny lines, I think it would have worked better. But, but his, his two minutes is is more interesting than all the stomper stuff put together. I, I, I listen. I won't argue with that. I mean, that's. <laughs> I get the scene is good. I like the idea that he walks in, he finds Paris, he's sitting there, and the TV's playing. And then when he hears, and there was also an unidentified man, and you see him kind of perk up, like, uh oh. Like, you know what I mean? And like, yeah. he, he realizes somebody's in the room, yada, yada. That is a very good moment. I like that a lot. You know, it's a moment I like. Um, 
when they come up to him and he's at that point when uh, Bond is at the party and he's just in, kind of insulted Elliot Carver. Yeah. And his goons come over and there's like a phone call for you, Mr. Bond. And Bronson's react Bronson's reaction is great, you know, because he knows yeah. he knows what's gonna happen basically. But he's like he he's gonna walk, he's gonna swing, he wants to see what's gonna yeah. happen, you know. Yeah. He wants to let them play their hand. Yes. So um but his knowing look is so great in that moment. And and that's another thing. Bronson's great here. He's terrific. Yeah. Um, he just he just needs a better script. Yes. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. kind of unfair in a way. I, I totally agree. Listen, I, I, li- I like, by the way, how that scene segues into that fight that happens in the soundproof room. That's another thing. This movie's pretty... I mean, everybody's like, oh, License to Kill. That's really violent. This movie's pretty ultra-violent. I mean, he kills That's- that guy with an ashtray. Pretty, and, it, and there's one scene where he casually stabs a guy with a knife near the end of the film. It's just like, ooh, mm. okay. I mean, and then, then, you know, by the end, it's like video game time where he's like, you know, two guns. Yeah, and yes, yeah. And I'm like, Actually, is this really what I want from a James Bond film? Is this really what... What, is this yeah. what we want as both fans? Well, st- well, stick it to your point about violence. I remember as I was rewatching it, mm-hmm. you know, when he when he breaks into the the newspaper um, printer printing press, yeah. I guess. Mm-hmm. Th- as he's running out, one guy grabs him and they fight, and he knocks the guy out. And then this little guy kind of grabs him, kind of runs up to him. Bond just like beats him up and tosses him into the into the printing press. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Blood splattering everywhere. Yeah. They'll print anything these days. And I'm like, this guy, he's probably, he's just a security guard. Like, I had a flashback of, like, Austin Powers when they, when they talk about, yeah. you know, the poor security guards who get yeah. bumped off and nobody cares. Yeah, yeah. You ever so, see the edited, uh, the deleted scenes from Austin Powers where they, yes. go, they do the whole thing? And I think it's, uh, isn't it Lois Childs that, that's in there? And it's like, she. Oh, maybe, like, actually. Oh, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. you, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty funny stuff. People never think how things affect the family of a henchman. The ending, the ending, definitely loses me. I, I totally agree with you. Once, oh, yeah. once, uh, yeah, uh, you know, there was an old uh, sportscaster in the um, in New York, New Jersey area named Water Wolf, and whenever <laughs> like you know, the, like say in the seventh inning, you know, the the team won the game pretty much. Uh-huh. He, you know, his, his saying was, "You kind of turn your sets off right there." That's the way I feel <laughs> about this movie. You know, it's like you know, after that motorcycle chase, you can turn yeah. your sets off right there. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I agree. Once we're once we're doing the stealth ship stuff, and he gets onto the stealth oh. ship, and and you know what too that there's like they he they employ some slow motion, which I don't think was meant to be slow motion, but they do it because it's unclear what's happening to, or just mm. to make sense. And don't get me wrong, hey man, you know um, Peter Hunt was guilty of that too in Thunderball with the freeze frames and stuff. But mm-hmm. there's, there's some kind of a charm about that. Here it just seems like a sloppy slow motion kind of thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, no. I listen. I'm with you. I, I kind of feel like. It once they're on the boat, you might like just hit the fast forward because it, it's. I feel like nothing interesting really happens there, you know. Like yeah. they, they they go in here, they go in there, they get captured, they're uncaptured, and and yeah, and, and then like and that's when all of a sudden Elliot Carver is walking around with a gun in his hand, yeah. like why? Because because he because now we have to the gloves are off and we have to see that this guy is dangerous, so he's just going to hold the gun in his hand even though. It doesn't really and seem his, to suit him at all. And his demise doesn't really hold water with me. It's kind of like you know, give you know, you forgot the first rule of, mm. of the, you know, give people what they want. But then he's like, he's standing in front of the drill, and then he's kind of like, oh, I'm, I can't move. The drill's coming. I don't know. I just, <laughs> I don't know. It's just, you yeah. know what I mean? Why not just sidestep? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, Bond's probably gonna shoot you anyway. But you know, I'd rather get shot than get but get torn up by that drill. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, you have to do one of the you know, I, I, and honestly, it's one of those tropes too that always bother me when they they have a bad guy who Bond would obviously beat the crap out of in thirty seconds, but so they have to do that little thing where the the bad guy gets the drop on him, gets one good shot in, so Bond's oh, so he's he's you know he's struggling yeah. to fight him. He's he's an old man for crying out loud. I mean, you you can't like. James Bond should clean the floor with this guy with no problem. Why? Why is there even a little struggle? <laughs> I know. Well, you know, it feels like I'm. I don't know. I guess there's moments, and it's like you said. You know, it's one of those. This is one of those where you know, even even if the sex is bad, it's good. You know, so it's kind of like my <laughs> bad sex bond, if, if if you will. But I still there's some things about it I still kind of like. Uh-huh. I don't. Yeah. We were talking about the Bond moments, though. I don't know if there's too many great Bond moments. They they kind of seemed a little cliched and forced at this point. I, they just don't seem. Mm. 
See, I, yeah, I listen, you know, when we were talking about License to Kill, and I said the problem for me is that the structure of the film is a revenge movie. Right. You know, it, it's not structured like a Bond movie with the revenge part thrown in. You know, yeah. rather, it's a revenge movie with the Bond stuff tossed in. Th this this suffers a lot of the same fate, where it's essentially structured to be an action film. I mean, it's basically at its core an action film, but they, they lace it pretty heavily with what I think are kind of Bondish moments. Like even, even starting out when, like when you open up with Bond up in um, Oxford, making out with the, the Danish girl and studying whatever. Um, See, that's yeah, kinda... I mean, usually I like that, but you know, I noticed in this Brazen area that, that, that's really awkward with the women. It, it just doesn't seem natural like it did in the Connery Moore era. It's, mm. how, can I, how can I put it? It seems obligatory and kind of forced. And it's like, they're always, Going with the leading lady, like I think would start maybe an adult narrow with like that license to kill with him and Pam. It seems like it happens, things happen too early. Although mm -hmm. I have to admit, you know, he does, uh, Waylon and him don't really get together at the end until the end. And I guess them ki yeah. kissing on the water with the explosions going on, that's kind of cool, you know? Yeah, I see. I thought that was a good moment. See, that was it clever. I, and yeah. when he, right, he's basically yeah. rescuing her by yeah. kissing her. And I kind of, yeah, I mean, how often can you pull that off? Mm -hmm. Um, I thought that was pretty good. That's what I mean. I mean, it, I mean, there are good tidbits mixed in here. Um, just the fact that I mean, we were talking about how you know you didn't like the scene on the ship in the beginning. I thought that was pretty clever. Um, you know, like a good it, it. Like you know, other Bond films have had that, where you, you open up a, on a military installation, etc. Um, I just feel like that scene is <clears throat> excuse me is like so like you're like okay you had your pre-title sequence and you had your main titles now you you're gonna get. We're just we're gonna get through this quickly. Stick with us because we got eight minutes, but it's exposition, but cool. It's kind of cool. It's got like a drill that can go through a submarine <laughs> and everything else. Uh -huh. We're gonna give you everything you need to know about the main character or the, the antagonist and his plot, and then you don't have to worry about it. You can just sit back and enjoy and let the thing just kind of glaze over you, uh -huh. and you you have to bring anything else to it. So yeah. just, just bear with us for eight minutes. I don't know. <laughs> That's the way I feel about it. Mm. <laughs> I, I I was really hoping that <laughs> I was really hoping that we were you were gonna kind of soften on this a little tried, bit, but uh, you know I wanted to too. I said, wouldn't it be cool if I came in here and I said, my goodness, I, and, and you know a new classic for me, an eight, you know. I I, I was hoping that would happen, but uh, you know I just did. I I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, yeah, I'm with you. I, yeah. I you know, and it, I mean seriously, I I it's not like I was ever like a super like hardcore fan of this one by any stretch. In fact, I kind of feel like between this one and the next one. You know, I, I feel like we have this good in it, and yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I agree that it's hardly, hardly a perfect film, and hardly a perfect Bond film. But again, I, I kind of feel like a lot of the elements are there. Um, but then again, we've talked about other films where I felt like the elements were there and something wasn't clicking. Um, I kind of like this one. This one is giving me enough of what I like that I can kind of let some of the other stuff slide. Uh, what are some? Just in uh, in summary, what are some of the things you like? I don't. Know, I don't know, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna. I'll be good. I'm gonna. Well, I. I mean, I think the locations are good. I think I the. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Um. I. I think the the essential like the espionage aspects of it are decent. Where you know Bond is sneaking around and and. Like, the, like, there's a part where, I mean, it doesn't take long before it breaks out into another run, jump, and shoot action scene, I admit that. Um, but, like, when he when he, when he he sneaky and finds the safe with the encoder in it and stuff, I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah, um, it's not bad. The characters are decent. Uh, the the villains are decent. Uh, maybe not so much Stamper. Um, and, and and the plot. I mean, the plot, and, and we not, you and I have talked about this in the past, the whole, the whole idea that this guy is going to essentially... You know, start a war just for ratings. Yeah, no, isn't it, is it just to get like exclusive break, broadcast rights in China for a hundred years, right? I think that yeah. I think that's the the goal. Like, yeah, yeah, that's his. That's what he wants. Yeah, really. I mean, it, right. I mean, is it the is that the dual end? But but I mean, honestly, in today's world, the idea that the media wouldn't stir up trouble for ratings. <laughs> yeah. You are fake news. No, it is, that, is, there, is that so hard to believe anymore? <laughs> I, I, that's what I wanted to. So I wanted to talk about. You know, I was hoping I would come on here and talk about the brilliance of this film and how I missed it back in the day and how it's so topical and how it applies uh, now to, to to today's climate. But mm. it's just it's just so shallow and 
I, the, 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 those ideas are there, but they're not, the, you know, yeah. they're always moving on to the next thing. So, yes. Yeah. I mean, honestly, seriously, you know, you're right. Yeah. But I, I seriously, I feel like that, that plot about him, him starting the war for the ratings, I thought back then was, was just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. It's preposterous. Now, right now, you're now, like, well, okay. <laughs> now, I, I feel like that's exactly yeah. what happens right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In a way, you're right. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, anyway. But um, I mean, so I, I feel like that's good, um, and you know, even as much as I'm not crazy about, like, like I said, once they get on the stealth boat, I kind of feel like it's just a snooze fest, and and I get it, the movie's over, nothing really happens there. Interesting, I, if they had done something a little more like the Spy Who Loved Me, where like maybe the cavalry shows up, and you got you have a whole bunch of people shooting as opposed to just you know bond kind of becoming rambo essentially just running around with a machine gun and that'll fix everything um so yeah so that easily could have been better but i but i like the idea of the conclusion where you go i mean that to me is sort of like an old school like this is kind of like going to the villain's lair and frankly it's probably the last time we've had anything like that um until maybe specter and we all know how that works um so, oh, God, that, but that movie's that movie's a masterpiece compared to this thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that, that'll be a fun review when we do that one. I know. You know, I, I came into this and I said, "Well, this isn't like terrible, terrible," you know. Um, but I had to go with my gut, you know, because I said when I first came in, I was thinking maybe this would be like a five. I said, "Yeah, that's middle of the road and blah blah." blah. But I'm like, you know what? It's I just I just can't do it. I. I, I <laughs> Um, I, I think I, if I recall correctly, I gave View to Kill a four, but I actually saw that in the theater a couple times, um, even though it wasn't a great film. This, like, like I said, I, I was a one and done in the theater for me and subsequent home videos. You know, it, this was the one Bond film when it came out in home video, I did not buy in release date. I just did not like this movie. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's huge. Do, you know, because it's like, you know, it's a no brainer. Release, I'm going to, it's a bond. I'm buying it. And, you know, for the longest time, I didn't have this. I don't think I got this until, you know how they got me? They released a version on DVD about a year later where it had a music only track. And I'm like, oh, you, go, you got me. <laughs> and then that's when I bought it um, for the first time. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give this a three. Um, I think I think this is um, this is not the way I want it done at all. Um, the cliched dialogue, you know, that's sort of trying to um, you know give you a taste of the past of what Bond is, but it doesn't quite get it. You know, um, the innuendos and everything kind of always getting away. This isn't as bad though. I think Die Another Day takes that to another level, which we'll talk about um, in, in a, few, a video, few videos from now. Um, um, I also think that uh, I just don't find the characters very interesting. I think they uh, Carver. Uh, I love Jonathan Price, and he makes a great villain. Um, but I feel like the mystery of the character is sort of blown in the first scene. You know everything you need to know about this guy. At least even like with Goldfinger, you kind of knew what this guy was about. But uh, you sort of got to hear about his plan and layers, which I really like. They give us a little sense of mystery um, to make the story more intriguing. Um, uh, Michelle Yeoh uh, will always have a special place in my heart. I love her. Um, I really respect her as a, not only an actress, but as um, one, of, one of my action heroes uh, from, the, from the late 80s, early 90s. Um, you should check out her stuff. Some of her early stuff, really good. Uh, yes, Madame, Wing Chung. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. Uh, uh, the Police Story 3, Super Cop. Uh, good stuff to check out. Um, and um, yeah, check out some of the Ricky J stuff. I mean, these people are so much better than other stuff. But yeah, um, besides from the brilliant, absolutely remarkable David Arnold score, um, there's not much here for me to recommend. So a three it is. Uh, yeah, I, I, I hear you. Everything you're saying makes perfect sense. I, I guess I've kind of come to, again, once I, once when I first saw it, the pacing bothered me, and I, I really bothered me. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying that that's changed in any way. Simply, it's I've kind of softened on it because I, I just watching it multiple times, and now I can sort of see through it. Um, I think kind of like how a lot of people have sort of softened up to Quantum of Solace. Um, I, I kind of ended up softening up on this one. Uh, so I'm going to go with a 7 because I feel like it's kind of on par 
with golden eye it's kind of it's pretty much cut from a very similar cloth and um i actually probably find this one a little more watchable than golden eye oddly um and so i'd probably i was almost gonna give it an eight frankly which i know is gonna put scott in the hospital but um i i i you know, so I'll call it a high seven, but it's a seven. I, again, I think it's it's a solid one, uh, hardly perfect, but got, got enough of the stuff I want to to make a decent Bond film. So I'll go with a seven. I'm gonna go with the that opening uh, sinking of the uh, of that uh, the ship after the um, pre-title sequence or the post you know post post credit sequence because it gives the whole bag away man it it it, it takes everything it, it 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 says hey this is LA Carver and this is the way he is this is his scheme and this is what he's going to do um and then that's it and i think they realize you know they get all that exposition out of the way um uh and and i guess it's done pretty painlessly i mean they they get a lot of eye candy for you to look at and so forth i think it's a mistake from a screenplay point um point of view um, because I think it gives away the whole bag, man. And uh, there's, there's there's nothing left. There's no story left after that. It's just a bunch of you know Bond versus Carver action scene. Bond versus Carver action scene. Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. It becomes very dull and boring. Ah, uh, this one might surprise you a little bit, but I'm going to go with Terry Hatcher as uh, Bond's lost love. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to cast somebody who essentially has got to be like the greatest Bond girl of all time because she's the one that Bond fell in love with and just couldn't handle being with her, uh, had to leave her, and is obviously still very much under his skin. Uh, you needed like a powerhouse here. And this is why, you know, I I've been saying that Monica Bellucci for years should have been a Bond girl, and this is exactly where I think she should have been. She was at, at her in the prime of her career, uh, perfect age, and honestly, I mean, I think she she would have been the one that if you took one look at her, you'd say, yeah, I can see that, how she would have knocked James Bond on his rear end. Uh, so yeah, I just, I, I find Terry Hatcher to be so kind of wooden and flat here. Um, yeah, it doesn't really work for me, so I'll go with that. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, sorry, man, I'm going to steal it. The backseat driver, that's probably the best, probably the most fun sequence in the film, even though um, the camera angles kind of suck sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, yeah, me with the bittersweetness here. Um, no, it's a fun sequence. And uh, to me, it's like the last major sequence um, in the film. Well, no, they have that bike sequence. That bike sequence is so busy, though. There's so much crap going on. It's hard to enjoy. Um, so yeah, I mean, this backseat driver to me, this is like when the film kind of, that, that's like the last little good part for me, then the rest of it's kind of downhill. Believe it or not, I'm going to go with the shot of Bond sitting in his room, <laughs> drinking shots of booze and, uh, putting the silencer on his PPK. I, I find that to be very kind of Dr. No-ish. Mm -hmm. And again, I kind of feel like those are the little nuggets in this film that I think kind of save it for me. Mm -hmm. um, a little more of that and a little less running, jumping, and shooting would have really gone a long way. Uh, I, I think that's a great scene. I also agree that the, the cutting in there is weird, the intersecting back and forth between Carver and... But um, that scene on its own, aces. Love it. Uh, yeah. So I will uh, see her next time, and uh, yeah. I guess uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, survive. The both of us will survive the end of this one. And yeah. uh, no, I, I apologize if you're if you're a fan of this film. This is your first Bond film. I apologize. I really, <laughs> do. I, I do understand because I'm sure I look. You look back at some of the films that I rated highly. You go, what the heck is this guy talking about? But sometimes it depends on your age and so forth. But I apologize for, to all those out there that really like this film. It just it just doesn't work for me. It's all good. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right, but we'll be back. Uh, I'm interested well. to talk to your talk to you about the next one. That'll that'll, that'll I'm interested yeah, to see fun. how you feel about that. One. Yeah, yeah, that'll be great. All right, so then I'll uh, see you next time. All right, bye bye. James Bond.